I'm Katie Hacker, your host, and we can always count on Mary Hetmansberger to think outside the box when it comes to supplies. Welcome, Mary. How are you doing? Great. We I'm are... so glad you're here. Yes, we are going to do something totally different. We're going to get color with tins. So antique tins, any kind of metal tins, decorative tins, um, super fun to play with and there's just an array and, and they're, they're very easily you know accessible. Well I could see you using this as a souvenir too. Like if yes. you're on a trip, you find a special tin, make Absolutely. some jewelry from it. I'm going to show you how to tackle one of these. Now you can use the bigger cut, the bigger cutters, but metal snips, but I actually just use my metal cutters. They tend to work pretty well. Where you run into problems is when you get into this area here. But what I have found is if you come in, on most of these tins, if you come in all the way to the bottom, what I have found, I'm hoping I won't be a liar here, is that they will break back pretty quickly once you get them kind of segmented out. Oh, okay. So once you get that broken, let me see if I can get this here. I think I'm just going to cut this one. You want to come in and cut. So what you're going for is more of a sharp angle there at the base so that yeah. you can use as much of the tin as possible, Exactly, right? exactly. So once you get that done, I'll just put this over here. Basically then, you've got some nice real estate here. So I can now come in with these cutters, and the nice thing about using scissors is it does sort of crimp that edge down already, so it makes it quite soft. So I'm just gonna cut a shape. And the sharpest parts are these here. So these can actually go into aluminum waste, which is nice. I'm going to put it over here. Oh, okay. And that, that makes it really nice. So you've got now this, this very nice base. And what I like to do, you can do an array of things with this. Now, I have actually burnt tins, but I don't recommend it highly because you don't know exactly what you're burning. So um, I have a tendency just to treat the surface. And I come in. This is actually just a hole punch that I'm using as a dimpler. So you could even put this through a rolling mill or you put it through a rolling mill. A you can put a hammer. texture, yep, texturing hammer. You can also do um, texture plates. And I'm going to go ahead and put a bunch of decoration on this. And then what's really nice is because it's just tin underneath, is you can come in and hit it with steel wool. Oh, so you're going to remove some of that right. color. Right. So I tend to use, you can use a real soft steel wool, or you can use one that's a little um, a coarser grade. The coarser grade I tend to use on the sides. At this point, are the sides pretty oh, well they're rounded actually, from your yeah, scissors? Yeah, and they're actually really nice and, and easily work with. They're not, they're not sharp at all. And I always cut rounded corners. You know, I don't want anything too sharp. And then this is a softer grade, and I just come in just lightly over the top, and you can see it starting to come to the surface. Just to, making some highlights there. Yeah. Nice. So you end up with your little, um, this one's really a... This one's a good one. So the color in this one, sometimes I start out very light like I did because this, this color is actually really good. So sometimes it takes a little bit more to get it off. So now you can see the, the little dimples coming out, which is really nice. Yeah, that looks so great. Yeah, so when I'm designing with the tins, I, you know, I want to, like you said, you can use historical tins. You got to, you got to be aware of what you're cutting up too because you, you don't want to cut up something that's too valuable. But What's interesting is tins that have like even rust on them and even have a, a lot of age can be a really interesting um, part of your jewelry. You could just incorporate that it right into your design. It can be incorporated to it. This happens to be an old gasoline can, and I actually didn't even clean it up too much. But I sprayed it afterwards with like a matte fixative. I was wondering if you would spray something. If it's got a surface, if it's got some other kind of patina on it or rust, mm -hmm. you definitely want to. But it if it's just real shiny, it's fine. I mean, things like the one that I just did or this where it's a, a newer tin, Yeah, and right that's along fine. here, it looks like you're, you removed even more of the paint at the edge. Do I you did. have to file or do you use You can steel use wool? a file. You can use steel wool. You can use a bench grinder. The, the only thing is with a file or a bench grinder, it can get pretty sharp. So go back to the steel wool okay. at, at the very end. Nice. So then you've got a nice surface. Then I, t then I t kind of play with my, um, you know, what my palette's going to be. So I'm going to take some silver, and again, I've just cut a shape of silver and I've got this one started I'm going to go ahead and put a texture on this and the same thing by cutting it with the metal scissors 
um, it's already kind of smashed down. Now this is a sterling silver and it's about, it's a 24 gauge. So you can use 24 or 26. So you don't mind mixing some I, sterling yeah. with some vintage. Yeah, I like, I actually really like that. So instead of using like a liver of sulfur or something to make this aged, what I'm gonna do is go to the torch and I'm gonna come in and just put a little bit of fire scale on this. So okay. I'm gonna come up here, turn this on. And safety glasses, right? Safety glasses, um, if you've got your own glasses, the main thing is just to you know be in a safe area. If you don't wear glasses, definitely. So I'm just gonna put a little bit of heat on the back of this and I'm watching it very carefully because I could actually burn this too much. And all I'm doing is just putting a little bit of fire scale on this. What would happen if you did burn it too much? It'll actually um, crack or even oh, melt. So you'll yeah. know. You, yeah, you'll definitely know. Um, so I'm gonna dry this off, and then I'm gonna take some steel wool. Here's a towel. And perfect. Dry this off a little bit. And I, I try to use as few chemicals as I can. So this is now just got some fire scale. And you just dipped it in water after and the I torch, And I just right? dipped it in water, yep. So I just cooled it off a little bit. And depending on what kind of look you want, if I want actually scratch marks, I'll use the coarser steel wool. If I want it to be um, just the pattern without any scratch marks, I'll use a finer steel wool. So this is like a two grade uh, coarse, and then the other one is um, like a double odd. I like the way that you mix a lot of different textures and you're not afraid to let your work show, you know, like the steel wool Well, marks. I think the more you let the work show, the more it shows that it's handmade. Which is, which is the best part. So when I'm now designing, I can take a piece here, and I've got one actually all set up on this side here, so I'll go ahead and do this. I've got a little one here, and I'm gonna poke holes in the middle of the, this one's already got one hole here. And this one, this texture was just done with the ball part of my ball peen hammer, but the same way. And now, I, I actually poked a hole in here and here. And the nice thing about the tins is that they're really quite thin. So not, not only can you dimple, but you can poke holes, but also unlike this one here, I can actually use a um, hole punch. The uh, a disc, disc cutter. cutter. A disc okay. cutter. I can use a disc cutter. And it goes right through. So it's a really nice, easy way to get a lot of different techniques. It really is the perfect um, weight. For it's a really a nice lightweight. And the main thing is to keep it from getting too sharp. So things like, um, pop cans, they're going to be too thin. And because they're, they'll be too sharp? They're going to be flexible. too sharp, too flexible. That's, you can't really get them work hardened, but this is really a nice weight. So I've cut an 18 gauge piece of wire here, and I've cut it about six, seven inches long. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to visually just divide this into thirds. So when I divide this into thirds, this now is sort of my, how I'm going to make my hanger for these. So on one of those thirds, I'm gonna come in, I'm gonna take my pliers, and you wanna make a really nice tight right bend. So I just hold my pliers still and just move the wire okay. so that I have a really tight right bend. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna put in some little spacers because it's really nice to have you know, different elements and they swing this way, but it's really nice if they also are dimensional. So by putting the little spacers in between the pieces, then what you end up with is... Um, oh, between all of them. So yes. you're going to get a lot of movement there. I get a lot of movement and I'm going to get a lot of... Oops, put two in that one. And I'm going to get a lot of um, division. This one looks different. What is this made of? This like a shell. It's like oh, a shell. Okay. So you could use metal, you could use shell, anything wood, you want. really yep. anything. So now I've got everything spaced and I really kind of randomly just put it great. together. And I put it together. How I do didn't... you come up with these combinations? Like, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Just like that. Just like that. It's amazing. <laughs> so I've got all of these all lined up. And now what I'm going to do is I still want a little bit of space in the back. So I don't want to get this too tight. And I want the same type of right angle as I had in the front. So I come in with my pliers and I'm going to be out about an eighth of an inch and bend that up again really at a nice tight right angle. And that way it almost has like a hanger effect. So you have the straight on the bottom and the square so on the sides. So still more movement. A lot more movement, yeah. Outside the components. So what I do is I cross these over and because I divided it the way I did, I have a short one and a long one. I'm gonna come into the cross area, or below the cross area. I'm gonna bend the short one and just wrap it. Okay, and when you were choosing your wire, is it dependent on the weight of the materials? I usually do 18 gauge for all of my necklace type things. Now if these were a pair of earrings, I'd probably do 20 and maybe you know work a little smaller. 
And then I'm going to take my cutters. And what I'm also going to do is make sure that the end is nice and crimped down so there's no sharp edges. And I'll take a little bead here. And then what I'm going to do is come in at the top. And when I do this, I, you know, everybody knows how to make wrap loops, but I kind of dumb them down because I like the look of these, the ones that I do. I actually just make more of a teardrop shape. So I bring the wire towards me. I bring the wire away from me, straight back. And then what I do is grab onto that loop that I've made and then wrap towards my bead. And this is with needle nose pliers. Needle nose pliers, pliers, right. And they're needle nose pliers because they grab real well. And then if you'll notice, I, I'm not a trained metalsmith, so I have a tendency to just do what is easiest for me. I use my hand to do the wrapping. I do that too, I do think it's easy. Whoops. So now I have the finished piece there. Nice. Now if you wanted to do a pin back on this, um, I, I've got an example here of a pin back and this is just using again the um, the tin in here but then on the pin back what I do is a lot of the commercial pin backs have very large holes so I have a tendency to use like little eyelets and these eyelets are 1 8 long and they are 1 16th deep and they're the perfect size. What's going to be um, kind of counterintuitive is you're actually going to put the eyelet, the commercial part, through this direction and hammer oh. from this way. So I just use a little square block to hammer that on and then okay. I've got a really nice base. Can you show us how to do one? Sure. Let me get, uh, let me get a piece of copper here. So when you're, when you're taking your piece here, you want to open it up and so I, one thing that I always do is I poke the hole, make sure that it is clean on the back side, come in from here. Now, this is a cool trick. If you have trouble like I do with your hands, what you can do is you can take a 20 gauge piece of wire, hammer about a quarter of an inch from the end, and then that way when you pick up the eyelet, oh, what a good idea. you put it on, and then you wanna put the commercial part through this direction, pull it through, and then anchor it. It's your own little setter. Own little setter. Now I need something square. Let me see. That's the only problem. I don't have anything square. Um, uh, there's another we round have a bench block. block. Uh, let me see here. Let's see if I can get it put together. I think I can. There we go. So now you've got one on, and then you do the same thing on the next side. So don't try to do the, I, I the do them one at a time. Matched, right? A lot of times you'll get off a little bit from your metal, and um, then it's a mess. It's just a mess. So I'm going to come in with this here. Oop. That's why I use the setter. Ooh. So this is another great cold connection that people can try. Absolutely. And a super way, super easy way to put a um, pin back on. Well, and that idea, again, there, you're mixing components that people don't always think to combine, like a store-bought pin back with right. your fabricated but, piece. Right. Now, once the pin back's on, then you can use those eyelets to set in your pieces here. And I always tell everybody if you're working, if you're working and you're developing a design, let's say I wanted to take this and I wanted to have this one and I wanted to have this one, then you want to start from the outside layers in. So I would start with my pin back first and then I would attach this to this and then this gets attached to this, this gets attached to that. And why is that important? Because if I had, let's say this piece down, and then you say, I want to put these two on. Oh, you can't. You can't. You can, but it's much more difficult. It's much more easy to start from the top layers, work your way down then. And would these be attached together with an eyelet or a rivet? These could be easily attached with an eyelet or a rivet. And, and you would, again, you would come in and, again, on this one, if this is my front piece, I can come in. I want to cut all of these holes. These, these I want to do all the holes because I'll set these one at a time then into my second piece. Okay. 
Let's take a look at the finished pieces and we can see how these all layer together here. And this one is all tins, so I didn't use any uh, metal at all. And a lot of times if I'm using all tins, I wanna make sure that the, the back tin is gonna be either sprayed or it's a really nice tin. I don't want it to be you know, rusted or anything. And then same thing with the other ones there. And I mix, you know, I do a lot of other, like the, uh, the one in the front is fused metal. So I've used a combination of some of my other work with the tins, but the tins are a real fun way to get um, a lot of color. I talked earlier also about burning, and this is one that I had actually um, actually taken outdoors. Make sure you take it outdoors if you're gonna over torch it a little bit. And it immediately had water there just to quench it off. So some of the, some of the paint kind of ran. These are amazing. Well, thank, thank you so much, Mary. Well, thank you.